Mythologies that built civilizations and are no longer working are just in rubble all around us. The old gods are dead or dying, and people everywhere are searching, asking, what is the new mythology to be, the mythology of this unified earth as of one harmonious being? The only mythology that is valid today is the mythology of the planet, and we don't have such a mythology. We need myths that will identify the individual, not with one's local group, but with the planet. It's all a question of story. We're in trouble just now because we do not have a good story. We're in between stories. The old story, the account of how the world came to be and how we fit into it, is not functioning properly. And we have not learned the new story. The old story sustained us for a long time. It shaped our emotional attitudes, provided us with life purpose, energized action, it consecrated suffering, integrated knowledge, guided education. We awoke in the morning and knew where we were. We could answer the questions of our children. We could identify crime, punish criminals. Everything was taken care of because the story was there. It did not make men good. It did not take away the pains and stupidities of life or make for unfailing warmth in human association. But it did provide a context in which life could function in a meaningful manner. Today, however, our traditional story is non-functional in its larger social dimensions, even though some people believe it firmly and act according to its dictates. It works in its limited orbit and encouraged to us as individuals, yet the dissolution of our institutions and our life programs continues. We see this in every phase of our present society. Aware of the non-functional aspects of the traditional program, some persons have moved on into different modern programs. But these programs, for the most part, have quickly become tangential. Most are revealed as ephemeral, as incapable of sustaining the life situation of this late 20th century. Other persons have returned to the earlier religious fundamentalism, but this too is quickly seen as a sterile gesture. Security is not there. The basic elements in the religious community of the modern world have become trivialized. What we offer our society serves only a temporary function. It simply enables us to keep a semblance of meaning in our institutions and in our public life. And then when we look outside the believing community, we see a society that's also dysfunctional. Even with advanced science and uh, technology, with superb techniques in manufacturing and commerce and communications and computation, our secular society remains without satisfactory meaning or capacity to restrain the violence of its own members. Our miracle machines serve ephemeral purposes. So we begin to talk about meaning. Where can we begin? My suggestion is that we begin where everything begins in human affairs with the basic story. The account of how things came to be at all how they came to be as they are, and how the future of humans can be given some satisfactory direction. We need a story that will educate the human community, heal the community, guide the community. There is no conflict between mysticism and science, but there is a conflict between the science of 2000 BC and the science of 2000 AD. That is the mess in our religions. 
we got stuck with an image of the universe that is about as simple and childish as you could imagine. The three-level universe and all of that, it is of no use to us. We have to have poets. We have to have seers who will render to us the experience of the transcendent through the world in which we are living. Science is always a working hypothesis in progress, which changes from decade to decade. The problem of mythology is to relate that actual found truth of science to the living of life. The myth has to deal with the cosmology of today, and it is no good when it is based on a cosmology that is out of date. Human beings have always had two types of language. We've had ordinary language, and ordinary language is what we use to talk about the weather and what's going to happen at the IU-Minnesota game this afternoon. And the language we use to gossip about our neighbors, and, and we even use it to, to build buildings or split atoms or map DNA or send a rocket into space. Ordinary language. But there's a second kind of language that human beings have always had. And that's mythic language. Mythic language is the language we use to talk about that which can't be talked about. Mythic language is the language we use to talk about ultimate things and our relationship to that ultimate reality. We use mythic language. Last month, we went to Kankakee, Illinois, to my wife's Uncle Jerry's funeral. Now, Uncle Jerry was six foot four. He was a big guy. And, and there on the table was a little bitty canister of ashes. Now what's the language that we use to talk about what is Uncle Jerry? We need some special language. When I think about where I was a hundred years ago, I need some special language. When I think about where I'm going to be a hundred years from now, I need some special language. When I think about all the intrusions of life upon my illusions of permanence, revealing again and again and again life's impermanence and the impermanence of everything, I need some special language. I need some special language when I encounter the rites of passage of life. Birth, kindergarten, graduating from the fourth grade, puberty, pimples, falling in love, kissing, sex, marriage, parenting, getting a job, getting a root canal, getting old, Getting divorced, making money, losing money, gaining weight, losing weight, obsessions, compulsions, getting a terminal illness, dying, death. I need some special language. Because sometimes life is just too much. In fact, I experienced that 
Life is always too much. An ordinary language won't cut it. I need some special language. I need some mythic language. But we have a problem today. We have a problem because our mythic language doesn't work anymore. All of our mythic language today is based on a science that is at least 25,000 years old. And this was the science, of course, that um, everybody was, it was a flat, it was a flat world. Earth was flat and there were layers. There was up there and there was down here. And, and of course, um, the, the sun revolved around the Earth. But it's important to understand, this was not some primitive tribal belief system. This was the science of the day. This was human beings doing the best they could do to use their rational intelligence to figure out um, what's what. That was the science of the day. Well, that's where all of our mythic language came from, both in the East and the West. It all came from that two-story thinking. Mythology pitches the mind to what can be known but not told. God is a metaphor for a mystery that absolutely transcends all human categories of thought. All the gods, all the heavens, all the hells are within you. It is not something that happened somewhere else a long time ago. It is in you. Language is a problem in Buddhism, not only in Buddhism, in all human cultures. Especially in Buddhism, when uh, Buddha awakened to the reality or Dharma, uh, he had hesitation to, start to teach because he, it said he thought that truth or reality he discovered was too deep and too subtle beyond human thinking. Therefore, there's no way to communicate uh, with other people. Even as he explained, uh, no one could understand. So he he, said, he thought it's easier for him to just, just be there by himself and, and uh, quietly die. But somehow, you know, the God, Indian God, Brahma, came down and asked him to teach. I think that was a very difficult time for Buddha. In order to teach, he had to translate what he experienced uh, into language. And that it took uh, at least uh, several weeks for him how to teach, how to express what he discovered using language. So it was a big challenge. And this, this challenge for Shakyamuni still continues today. What is the Dharma as reality? And what is the expression of Dharma or explanation of Dharma using language? When we study even our Buddhist sutras, we are thinking using discriminating mind, and we think using a, a concept or concept and logics. That is how our brain works. Otherwise, we don't understand what is said. Often, this written teaching what is the expression of the reality is uh, called a finger uh, in the Zen tradition. Finger that point the moon. So the real thing is not the finger, but the moon. But often we think we think about the finger. So it's really a challenge for uh, all Buddhists. How can we see the moon instead of finger. 
often uh, the masters without explaining using uh, words, concept, and logics. Uh, he, their uh, famous teaching method is hitting, shouting, and uh, speaking something nonsense. That is the, to help their students to become free from their uh, conceptual thinking. Uh, that is one part of very important than teaching. But uh, Dogen has, uh, in a sense, very unique uh, the master. Uh, for him, expressing the Dharma using language is very important. He said, when we experience something, unless it, can, it is expressed using language, you didn't really express, experience it. So language uh, expression using language is really important. That makes our understanding also clear. Ryokan said, a finger is also a moon, or a finger is a part of the moon. In Dogen's tradition, uh, language is really important. So he, uh, in order to use language as an expression of reality itself, uh, unless we understand what he experienced, what he uh, tried to express, you know, he, just reading his uh, words doesn't make sense at all. Uh, practice the same thing or, uh, with him, I think that means in his case, or in our case, uh, practice Zazen and experience what he experienced. It's really important to understand his uh, language. Uh, and when we share the same experience, we see the language is actual uh, expression of what we experience, same as Dogen. So a publisher called and asked me, if, uh, if uh, they had seen an interview of all things that I had done and said, I think there's a book in here. I said, really, what is it? She was calling from California. I'm sitting in an office in Erie, Pennsylvania. And she said, well, this, this whole Benedictine thing. So I said, well, you know, um, I could give you lots of names. She said, no, 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 we, we know all of that. We, we wanna know more about what you said in this interview. So, uh, so I, I said, well, in other words, you want me to tell my mother what we do here? She said, that's it. <laughs> so I said, I could do that. I can do that. So I wrote that book. And then I was giving a workshop someplace. There were three speakers. I was one of those three. And they had asked me again to do something on Benedictinism. So I, I said, yeah, OK, I, I'd do that. I'd, I'd put something together on chapter seven on humility, my favorite chapter in the rule and the rule in which, that I think is Benedictine spirituality. And at any rate, there was a big, wonderful African-American woman preacher there. And she followed me and she got up to the front of the room after I had done this expose of uh, what many people would call the most difficult chapter in the rule. And she looked at that crowd, she said, honey, she said, I, I, I don't know what to say. I, all I can tell you is, I don't know where she got all that stuff. She said, I read that book and I didn't understand a word of it. And I, I walked out of there that day and said, Joan, that's true. That's true. Somebody has to say what it means now and never mind what it, what it meant in the year 990 in Germany. And so I sat down. Another publisher said, would, would, you, would you do something on the rule? And I said to myself, unless you do it a paragraph at a time, Joan, it will have no more meaning than it does right now. And so I did the whole commentary saying to myself, can, can this wonderful couple who live down the road from the monastery, is this a spiritual life that will have any meaning to them?